1879, Thomas Edison invented the, the uh, first commercially viable light bulb. He patented it. The very next year, he set up the Edison Electric Company um, in order to distribute and power these light bulbs he had invented. I think you're all asking, wondering, what has this got to do with Accenture? I'm Laddie Greenstreet. I'm part of Accenture Ventures, um, and I lead our healthcare practice. Accenture Ventures is put into two parts. We have open innovation and our strategic minority investment arm. So open innovation is um, all about how do we find the next big thing. How do you find the next commercially viable technology? The second part is how do you grow it? So Thomas Edison wasn't the first person to create the light bulb. There had been 70 years of light bulbs created before him. He was the first person to make it commercially viable. But next, he had to set up his, the next company in order to make sure that, that, pro that product or that solution he had got scale across the market. 12 years later, so in 1892, I think we're talking about now, um, he managed to uh, cover three quarters of the US market. Pretty impressive stuff. So within Accenture Ventures, what we're trying to do is find the light bulb, next, the next big thing, and also work towards allowing that, that next idea to scale. Right? So we're supporting the ecosystem as well. What we also have as well is supporting that ecosystem with investment. So let's start talking about what open innovation is. Open innovation in principle is the um, idea that within a commercial organization, much of the innovation can lie outside the four walls of an organization. So on the left hand side you see we have a healthcare organization, a healthcare payer, provider, um, and, uh, or a life sciences company. Typically, traditionally, you would find that we would expect the innovation to lie within those four, four walls. We'd pump money into R&D, um, get a lot of smart people working really quickly, and understand that we'll try and create it ourselves. Or we could work with Accenture and allow our smart people to create that innovation for you. The idea about open innovation is, let's look, let's stop, let's look beyond our four walls and understand that within the ecosystem, within Silicon Valley, um, across North America, there are a lot of startups who are surviving um, each day, um, living and breathing, of trying to create the next big thing. So what we try and do is be, become the bridge builder between those healthcare organizations and the startup ecosystem. So today, I want to talk about um, so how, how we work with startups, why we do it, and then after a uh, brief few minutes, I'm going to introduce two companies, uh, one, uh, one Qubit and Quio, to, Good evening. to discuss how we actually worked in the past. The VIP floor is now in the previous, closed. In the previous um, panel, we look forward to uh, one of the things I mentioned was like, how do, you work, how do big organizations work with small startup companies? And I think that a lot of panelists said one great thing, which was that one of the tough things about bringing the two together is culture. So in Accenture, what we feel like as a bridge builder is we can start to de-risk that. We can start to narrow that gap between the culture of the big organization and the culture of the startup by using the relationships we already have and start, working, and start working together to make sure that we create the perfect fit and the perfect match. We're going to do this in three ways. So one, we want to connect the ecosystem to our organization, so we're going to work with the startup ecosystem. Two, we're going to try and then identify what is the next big thing, what is the light bulb, um, what is the next big piece of technology. And then three, we're going to provide those services, that insight knowledge that um, the, the Edison General Electric, the infrastructure to help grow and support that innovation going forward. And we feel because of our existing relationship with these healthcare organizations, the way we know them so well, and our new tentacles into the startup ecosystem, we can provide that, that synergy and make them um, mesh well together. So... <laughs> Something sounds to the slide, so I think you can kind of see it. But essentially, so the first thing is the open, open, innovation, open innovation network. So the first thing is the ecosystem. How can, we, how can we find the next big thing? Well, I just, just stated before that 
many of these innovations are existing across, across North America, across Silicon Valley, and across the world. So our first, first port call is to partner with some of the great um, institutions like Startup Health and other ecosystem partners, accelerators, VCs, government entities that are already working with these companies and help try and source some of this great innovation. So within the last couple of years, we've built and established some great partnerships going forward. And, and um, Startup Health is one of them, and this is kind of essentially why we run, on, run the, uh, the Startup Health Challenge. Next, we perform some industry analysis. So we have, from all our tentacles, as I call them, uh, we now have portfolio upon portfolio of startup information coming in that we then analyze and try to understand, well, what is the next big thing in um, adherence? What is the next big thing in, um, in diabetes um, therapy? So we do that, we bring them all in, we develop thought capital, and understand, okay, which is the next big thing, and um, can we identify it? And then finally, uh, we then bring that together towards both the startups and our clients to provide services. So what, what does this look like? So what we're trying to get to stage is where a client of ours will, will essentially have low risk in adopting a startup. It will have increased speed because the fact that, the fact that we already have the relationships with the, the C-suite of the, our clients, um, and we have processes in place which allow us to quickly get through, through procurement, for example, adds benefit, and we will add scale. And that's kind of, again, where the, the final piece comes in, is how do we scale these? It's all right, we can all find some great piece of technology, but the light bulb would not have taken off if Edison hadn't started the Edison Electric Company. He needed that for distribution. He needed that to scale that product and that idea. And, so that's, and that's where we really focus on. The next piece, which I'll, I'll talk to you very briefly, is that we also have the resources to support those startups through investment. Now, as we're scaling these companies, what we also want to do is, is make sure that they survive and thrive. And one of the ways we can do that is by investing them with um, dollar amounts. We don't take a, a leading position. We're not looking for return on our investment. What we're looking to do is have some skin in the game to make sure that we, we are putting our money where our mouth is. And that's the uh, minority investment. So next, I, I've, I've spoken enough about um, ourselves. I wanted to bring on stage um, iQubit to talk about how they worked with us. So that's a fascinating company, very exciting technology, but they're going to talk about how they've worked to scale their technology um, with some of our clients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I'm with OneQubit. We're a quantum computing software company. We're developing quantum and quantum-inspired software solutions for various applications and industry. And today what we've been hearing about is innovation, collaboration, and impact. There's no doubt that new computing technologies lead to explosive disruption and unprecedented capital creation opportunities. Perhaps many of the ones that you've heard about today. Take, for example, the development of the integrated circuit. This process, the Fairchild process, is still used to this day. Over 400 companies trace back their roots to this. Another example, the first microprocessor, introduced in 1968. Over 100,000 employees and over $160 billion valuation. Take Microsoft. The IPO of Microsoft created three billionaires over 12,000 millionaires. The only constant, the only constant in technology industry is change. And we are headed for some radical change. Consider, for example, this problem. 250 light bulbs, what are the possible permutations of on-off sequences for these light bulbs? This is an exponential problem, 2 to the 250th power. Solving this problem classically, it's not really scalable. The solution is more than the number of atoms in the observable universe. And we know that current classical approaches can't begin to solve this type of problem. This is classically an intractable problem. One qubit is working with our partners to leverage the next computational paradigm shift. We've been here before. We're now facing the fifth paradigm shift. We've gone from vacuum tubes to transistors to the integrated circuit to the microprocessor, 
and now to quantum-inspired processors and quantum processors. So what makes a quantum computer so different? A quantum computer is essentially an information processing system that harnesses three quantum phenomenon. Superposition, where instead of a zero and a one, you can have both a zero and a one and some position in between. Entanglement, where one particle can be entangled with another particle so that its impact is felt, is felt across. And of course, quantum tunneling, the ability to overcome potential energy barriers by tunneling through them. This theory has exist, these theories for quantum computing have existed for decades, and we are only now beginning to be able to put them to practice and test them with early prototypes. Take IBM, D-Wave, and Google. Quantum computers are now a reality at the prototype stage. And just like in the classical computing world, there are different types of processors that solve different types of problems. There are similarly different types of quantum processors that can solve different types of problems. Gate model quantum computing or quantum annealing. And the rate of change, the rate of development, is actually increasing significantly. This year alone, consider in April, Google announced their new chip to, towards achieving quantum supremacy. And then provided their blueprint for how they're going to do it. This was in October. A week later, Intel talked about their new exotic quantum, exotic quantum processor. And two weeks after that, a 49-qubit simulated quantum computer. And then IBM presented their 50-qubit quantum processor in November. We are at the knee of the exponential curve. The quantum ecosystem in 2018 is growing very rapidly. Every year, we're seeing more and more companies, more and more players emerging in this field. Because the opportunity is frankly unprecedented. All of these industries, all of these domains, stand to benefit from the application of not just quantum computers, but also hybrid solutions that are based on both classical and quantum processors. And this is where one qubit comes in. We focus on applying our knowledge of application and providing direction to hardware manufacturers to build features that will be of value to the industry. One qubit software sits at the interface of real-world industry problems and the hardware manufacturers making the different types of exotic hardware. This allows us to do two things. First, it allows us to identify those multi-billion dollar market opportunities for which solutions currently can't be found. And it allows us to go to hardware manufacturers and share with them these significant market opportunities and the types of quantum processors that are needed to be able to eventually address them. We're also able to give feedback to industry partners about the opportunity and the potential disruption that is headed into their marketplace and how to prepare for it in advance so that they are not left behind when these opportunities turn from potential to reality. And so one qubit is solving some of the industry's most demanding computational challenges by recasting these problems and leveraging the power of quantum computing. We need quantum software to be able to do this. We know that quantum hardware requires software that is designed for its architecture, given that quantum computing architecture is fundamentally different than classical computing. We know quantum software frees users from the underlying complexities, which there are many of, when it comes to quantum computing. And most certainly, quantum software allows developers to use familiar programming tools to build applications for quantum computers. I'm going to switch a little bit and talk about what are some of these industry applications, these industry examples. One qubit has been working on the life sciences domain, among many others that I showed you earlier. And in the life sciences domain, we've been developing a virtual screening tool for identifying lead drug candidates. We've also been working in the finance sector. This is an optimization type problem. We've also been working in oil and gas, looking at combinatorial optimization. There are unique characteristics to the types of problems that stand to benefit from quantum computing. These are problems that are focused on optimization, 
sampling, and certainly things like big data analytics and machine learning. I'll chat a little bit more about our virtual screening tool. Molecular similarity, the molecular similarity tool that OneCubit has developed can be applied for protein-protein interaction networks to identify new drug target opportunities. This can be applied for DNA sequence similarity analysis, and the first area of focus that we're primarily focusing on is virtual screening and drug discovery. This work we've been doing in partnership with Accenture and Biogen, where this molecular similarity screening tool is being used for the identification of, of new drug candidates. But there are more opportunities here, particularly in life sciences and healthcare. Take, for example, being able to do confirmational analysis. What is the most optimal and preferred confirmer of a particular molecule? And identifying that for designing different types of, different types of chemical structures. Being able to understand the energetics and the favorable, favorable structural conformations that a molecule can adopt. These are complex computational problems. And of course, going further, being able to use these types of tools to develop new types of advanced materials. Eventually, we hope that as we develop these technologies and these tools, using both classical and quantum approaches, that we can begin to do high-performance molecular modeling to study drug and protein interactions, and be able to both look at conformational analysis information, but also energy estimation of the molecule's thermodynamic properties. But this, is, this isn't the only area of focus. There's opportunity in big data analytics. Look at this 40,000 point cloud, being able to simplify 40,000 data points into specific clusters to be able to draw meaningful relationships that are true to the original data set. This is a tool that we've developed in-house and is being applied to a variety of different problems, including, in this example, retail and, bank and banking, um, banking retail opportunities. What we're looking at are not incremental advancements, but significant changes in recasting how we develop solutions to these problems. Being able to bring a completely different perspective to solving problems that classically haven't been solved. And this requires innovation, collaboration, and eventually leads to impact. And it's because of this that we've partnered with Accenture. Accenture is also an investor in OneCubit. We recently announced our $45 million Series B, with invest including investment revenue. We've also formed a channel partnership with Accenture, where Accenture's clients who have specific kinds of needs will now be able to work with us to address new kinds of solutions to some of their existing problems. We're delighted to be partnering with Accenture to be able to do this. Because Accenture has a very unique place globally in being able to understand analytics and their client base and identify new problem spaces and opportunities for disruption, for significant disruption. One of the most important things, especially given the conversations we've had today, is the ability to take your startup organization and be able to scale it up. And one of our approaches to this is to partner with organizations like Accenture. OneCubit has approximately 50 employees. Our team is small. We do not have the breadth of resources and expertise to cover every single problem in every single domain. This requires us to be creative. This requires us to collaborate, which enhance, which, which eventually allows us to innovate solutions to completely new types of problems. Thank you so much for your time and energy. Thank you so much for having me today. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian O'Mani. I'm one of the co-leads for the Accenture Health Tech Innovation Challenge, and I have the pleasure of introducing to you last year's innovation champion, CEO and co-founder of Quio, Alexander Damani. Hello, everyone. I was uh, thrilled to be invited back. I think I'm a very grateful partner to Accenture, and it was a great experience we had last year at the uh, Accenture Challenge in, in 2017. Um, so at Quio, we're a connected therapeutics company, and we provide software and services that are enabled by smart medication devices. And what our solutions do is they help chronic disease patients succeed on long-term therapies 
and at the same time, we help stakeholders track the real-world performance of these therapies. What we define as connected therapeutics are pharmaceutical products equipped with sensors and wireless connectivity. And what that does is it enables remote monitoring of dose-level adherence data for the first time. This includes smart medication containers like pill bottles and pill dispensers, smart drug delivery devices like auto-injectors, and smart add-on sensors for existing devices like inhalers, pens, auto-injectors. And you can see that the, the introduction of connected therapeutics closely tracks with the rise of smartphones, which makes a lot of sense because they share uh, common sensors and uh, wireless technologies. And one of the big promises of these uh, new technologies is the ability to measure adherence and hopefully improve adherence. And a lot of people are excited. They think that these devices will be great for uh, passively recording doses and automatically reminding patients that forget to take a dose. But if you dive deeper into the problem of adherence, it's actually not one problem. It's a collection of many different problems. And this is a great illustration of that. It's one of the largest adherence studies published, and it was published last year by CVS, with over 50,000 participants. And it tested three different reminder devices. And what it found was these reminder devices did not improve adherence. And what the authors uh, concluded was that they may, be, may have been more effective if it was coupled with interventions. And this is what we believe. We believe that reminder devices Connected devices, they're not the solution to the problem because there's so many different forms of non-adherent behavior. We think they're the starting point. We think that connected devices are the way you detect non-adherence in near real time. And what the solution is, is a number of different interventions that are personalized based on the data collected and that are targeted to the right patient at the right time. And that's where the software and the services come in. And so this, the literature really informed how we uh, created our offering in terms of measuring and improving adherence, starting with the connected devices. We believe the connected device, its main uh, purpose is to passively collect data, not to remind the patient. And so we designed our devices with cellular connectivity instead of Bluetooth, because Whatever you can do to help the patient use the device more reliably long-term provides the data that you need to then deliver and personalize those interventions. And so in addition to our cellular connected devices, we have software and services that we connect to these patients enrolled in the programs. Starting with the hardware, we don't just have one connected device because injectable therapies need uh, different formats in terms of what the device does. So starting with our SI pen, it's a reusable pen injector for multi-dose cartridges, such as insulin. Our SI1 is a reusable auto-injector for syringes, which most of the biologics and some of the rare disease drugs are commercialized in. Our SI pod is a more premium auto-injector, which com is combined with a dose cassette. And in that dose cassette, there's a single dose of injectable therapy, and there's a chip that can track that dose through distribution. And then the auto-injector, when it gets loaded with it by the patient at home, does a quality check, confirms it's the right drug, the right dose, it's not expired, it's not recalled. And finally, our SI pack is for existing injection devices. It retrofits these devices with sensors and connectivity, which is important because pharma companies have invested so much time and resources in these current injection devices, and there's long regulatory timelines for new devices. All our devices have two things in common. One, they passively record dosing events, and two, they have cellular connectivity for immediately uploading that data after the injection is complete. The other side of our business is our software. And so we built the first cloud platform specific for connected therapeutics with the assumption that dose level data is now available. And we use that data to provide automated care. So we target content, information, alerts, behavioral interventions to patients that are non-adherent confirmed at the dose level. 
in addition to the context we collect to learn why they're not adherent, which is an important uh, data point for personalizing which intervention you deliver. For the 10 to 20% of patients with the lowest adherence, the ones that aren't responding in terms of self-management tools and automated interventions, we have software for coaches and caregivers to remotely monitor and support these patients to provide more sophisticated, more empathetic behavioral interventions. And then we take all that data that we collect from the devices, our care solutions, we de-identify it, and we make it available to our clients, which helps them first understand how their drug's being used in the real world, which not many people know today. And then we also show them how it's performing in the real world in terms of adherence, persistence, and outcomes. We presented at the Accenture semifinals last year in New York, uh, which was great because we're a New York company. And what was great about the semifinal specifically was the number of judges and the time you had with these expert judges. So you had a really in-depth conversation, you demoed your product, you talked about business model, and it didn't just help you hone your pitch, it helped you hone your company. Um, so that feedback was invaluable and prepared us for the finals. And the finals was great because there's even more people in the room, so you had a ton of uh, meaningful conversations after the event, and one of the most uh, meaningful conversations was with uh, the guy on the right, who I took a selfie with after we won. And this actually led directly to a major partnership we announced in November. And so, Raman works for SHL Group, which is the leading designer and manufacturer of auto injectors worldwide. And I actually felt bad because Accenture kept asking for updates after, after the event, and we couldn't talk about this partnership, but we did announce it in November. And it, it really solves a lot of problems for us. Uh, it is a strategic investment, but in, in addition to that, there's an operational partnership. So they're going to be taking our devices in terms of development, manufacturing, and marketing to their pharma customers, which is most of the top pharma companies in the world. And it enables us to focus on the software and services, which we'll be the exclusive provider of for all these connected devices coming to market. And so going forward, through our experience with Accenture, meeting SHL Group and partnering with them, we have a very different strategy that, from a year ago. And so we're now positioned as a software and services company, focused on partnering with device companies, not just SHL Group, we're talking to a number of different injection device companies, inhaler companies, uh, pill monitoring companies. And our vision is to, first off, help them offer a comprehensive solution, not just the device in a vacuum, but the device and the software and the services for measuring and improving adherence. And hopefully, we'll help the patients that are distributed these devices use them correctly, better manage their treatment regimen, better manage their condition. And so my ask would be if there's any med tech companies, pharma companies with a connected device initiative, we'd love to talk to you because our goal is to support you in terms of developing and launching your solution and hopefully helping patients. Thank you. The votes are in, ladies and gentlemen. And we have our innovation champion and our top innovator. I'm going to ask a couple of the judges to come up and to give the awards. Um, I want to make, uh, before we do that, there were, it was very close, actually, um, between three startups. Uh, unfortunately, one of those three didn't get the award, but it was like by one vote. It was paper thin. And we wanted to just call that out and just sort of have a round of applause and give an honorable mention to Peptone for coming third. So, well done. So I'd like to introduce onto stage from Merck KGAA, Darmstadt, Germany, Thank you. Isabel de Pauli. Thank you. So I have the pleasure today to introduce the Top Innovator Award for 2018. And I have to admit, it's a team that actually I have seen in Boston. 
um, and where I had to do a little bit of reading to understand what they actually are doing on their mathematical models, but I have to admit I still don't really understand it, so maybe I have the chance later on. I would like to welcome on the stage for the Top Innovator Award the team of Javion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Congratulations. Much. Thank you. Was wonderful. All right, thank you. Do you want to say a few words? Do they want to say a few words? Go. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much, guys. All right, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and to announce the uh, the Innovation Champion Award. Um, I'd like to introduce on stage James Hereford from Fairview Health. Thank you, sir. Well, first of all, let me say congratulations to all the teams because having been here last year and then uh, repeating this year as a judge, uh, it's just very impressive, all of the teams and what they brought. But it is my distinct pleasure to be able to announce the Innovation Champion, which is Nanoware. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Come on, Dad. Congratulations, well done. Congratulations, well done. Congratulations. Camera. Congratulations. Can you say some words? Sure. Might as well. I got a mic. Thank you very much. Well done, guys. Do you want thanks. To uh, just want to say thanks to all the judges volunteering your time. Thanks to Accenture. Thanks to Startup Health. Uh, as uh, Quio said, we've been fortunate to be able to participate in, in a couple competitions. And I think the time that the judges and the coaches and Accenture personnel spend with all of us throughout uh, the process was uh, second to none. I think this is a phenomenal competition. And uh, I look forward to being a part of it uh, as a group and as alumni uh, going forward. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. So that's it. That's uh, another, another Health Tech Innovation Challenge over. Um, all that remains to be said is the uh, hopefully see you again next year. Thanks.